Okay, this is the second video of our in-depth series where I talk about the technical details of the bikes. If you haven't already seen it, I did one last week on the low pivot frame, the first frame I built, and basically went over the construction, kinematic, and all the geometry of that bike. And this week, I'm gonna go over the high pivot frame, the second one that I made, talk about construction, kinematic, and geometry of this one. So for starters, I tried to make these frames as similar as possible, construction-wise, for an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. There's definitely some things that I learned on the first one that I wanted to improve, but I didn't want to ride this one and think it was better just because we used better bolts, better hardware. I wanted them to be as similar as possible, only isolating the axle path, really, and inherently the pedal kick with the either pulley as the only two differences between the two frames. So to get into the construction, this bike was also made at Frank the Welder's shop in Vermont. All the materials are 6061 heat treated to T6. The tubing Frank chose, um, I did the 2D design on a pretty basic software called Linkage where I chose all the pivot locations and geometry of the bike. Then we gave that 2D file to an engineer who made a 3D model of it so that we could put the tubing in, design the CNC pieces that we needed to make, and Frank suggested what tubes he thought were suitable for a downhill bike, and we kind of connected all the pieces that way using my pivot points and geometry. So I used pretty much all the same tubing as a low pivot bike. The top tube is a inch and a half by 083 wall straight gauge tube. The down tube is a inch and three quarters by 083 wall straight gauge tube. Frank put the bend here using a die and bender that he has at his shop. Um, and he was able to get a pretty good bend on it to clear having a shock mounted upside down, which is something that I wanted. The up tube on this bike is the only difference. We actually had to custom make this up tube because it's a metric rectangle. When we made the main pivot yoke for the high pivot bike, to have everything fit in there correctly and not have the bearings sit outside the wall of the rectangular tube, we had to use a wider metric rectangle. And for this one, we took a piece of sheet metal, folded it, and made a monocoque rectangular tube. So it was a lot more work. It was a pretty complicated thing. But just making one, it was quicker and easier to go that route than to try to order a custom tube. And then the seat stay and chain stay are also rectangular tubes, inch and three eighths by three quarter inch with a 065 wall thickness. And I didn't want to confuse anyone in our last video. There's a kind of a mix of metric and standard tube sizes, but most of the tubing that I just called out is all imperial measurements. So. Like for example, the top and down tube that are 083 wall, it's about 2.1 millimeters thick. So with aluminum, that's something that Frank thought would be a suitable thickness, but not overdoing it to where the bike's rigid and super heavy. CNC parts for this bike, um, everything that was shared from the last bike would be the head tube, ZS56 top and bottom, the rear dropouts that use the Paragon hanger, the bottom bracket, which is a threaded 83 mil bottom bracket. Someone said that wasn't a BB30, it was an English BB. So whatever a threaded 83 mil shell is, that's what we're using. Um, the seat stay bridge here, the links on this bike are the same kind of not great design that, we, that I explained from the last bike. But on this one, at least the windows closed already we didn't weld it closed and they're 70 75 so it's a little bit stronger metal um, yeah and then a couple other little things like the these clevises that attach to the horse link and the brake mount iscg tabs stuff like that were all also cnc machined at the cnc prototyping place so the, the main difference between the two bikes from a CNC standpoint was we made this main pivot yoke that held the either pulley in a design where the chain goes through the frame. Pretty much took a trek apart, took a bunch of pictures of it, 
and reverse engineered it. They spent a bunch of time making something that works really well. It's not something that's patented, it's just the way that they constructed their frame. So we thought, why not just uh, use something that's proven and works, works great. So it looks just like a Trek main pivot, but the other pulley location in relation to the main pivot is my design and where I wanted those two to be. Um, we also used this 3D printed cover that kind of keeps mud out of there and hopefully keeps the either pulley a little bit less exposed to the weather. And so far it's been working great. I've been really impressed how this pulley wheel has lasted. Um, I've definitely ridden some bikes where the either pulley is only supported from one side with a bolt and it wears out the bearing really fast, um, wears out the pulley wheel. This pulley wheel is 70-75 as well, so it's a stronger material, and I wasn't even sure if that would be strong enough. I thought maybe we'd have to go for a steel either pulley, but this one seems to work good. It's I've ridden it for a while now, and it's perfectly straight and not worn out, and it almost doesn't even have the anodizing worn off it, so it's been working really good. It's a 14 tooth idler pulley, which is as big as I could fit with a 34 tooth chainring. If I go to a 32, then I'm way down in my gear range on the cassette. So I wanted to be in a 34, I mean, ideally bigger, but to keep the pivot down and not being a super high pivot bike and fitting a reasonable size pulley wheel, this is the best I could do. And running a even tooth, a 14, I could do a narrow wide pulley wheel, which I, I didn't try them both, but if you can do that, I think it only can help for chain retention. Okay, so geometry on this bike is pretty much the same. It's a 63 degree head angle, 345 bottom bracket height. The chain stay on this one is 450, but at SAG, both bikes are the same. So I made it a little shorter because it has a more rearward axle path. Um, I think that's something you have to consider when you look at bike geometry is the dynamic geometry as well. Um, where the bike sits at SAG makes a big difference on how it, how it rides, more so than static. Um, the reach is 475. The wheelbase is 1300 and on all my bikes I'm using a 52 mil offset on the fork. I find that of the ones that Fox offers, 52 seems to be the sweet spot. And this bike uses a 29 inch front wheel and a 27 inch rear wheel as well. Uh, I talked a little bit about the advantages of clearance in the last one. And I also wanted to mention that I think that whatever wheel size the bike is intended to use, it will feel best and most balanced with a wheel size that's designed from the ground up. For example, if it's supposed to be a 29er and you have to do some flip chips and geometry adjust to fit a 27.5, you're going to notice the compromise that you made on the geometry and the flip chip affecting the kinematic more than you're going to notice the difference in wheel size. So as long as the bike is riding the wheel size that it was intended for, I feel like you can get a good balance on a mullet or a 29. All right, on to the kinematic. This bike is 28% progressive. It starts at just a hair over 3.3 to 1 and finishes at 2.4 to 1. Um, I'd like it to be a little bit more progressive. I find that 30 seems to be the sweet spot for me, but I wanted to change as few things as possible to have an apples to apples comparison. I could have made the bikes a little closer on progression as well if I had changed more pivot points, but the only two points that I changed are the main pivot, obviously to make it higher, and the shock mount on the rocker. So only those two points are different and I was able to keep the kinematic very close between the two bikes. The anti-rise on this bike is a little higher. I'd say it's still generally low, but not as low as my low pivot bike. Um, it starts at 69%, just an arbitrary number, no significance, and finishes around 48%. And when you move the main pivot up, you're gonna have a higher anti-rise number. And in turn, the bike's gonna feel like it loads the spring more under braking. So it has, uh, the bike squats and has a stiffer feeling. Depending on what you want, that could be a good thing. I find that the more active, unloaded spring under braking feels good for me. So 
it was definitely a compromise to do that, but anytime any bike that has a high pivot is going to have a higher anti-rise number. Unless you do a floating brake mount, and I wasn't ready to go that route just yet. <laughs> Axle path on this bike is really nice. I would say, compared to any other high pivot bike, a bike with an idler pulley, this is the lowest high pivot that I've seen. So the rear axle comes to zero at 200 mil travel, which I think is super neutral. Um, it still has some of the advantages of a high pivot with a uh, axle path going backwards from sag, but it doesn't have a lot of the big disadvantages of a really high anti-rise number or a bike that grows a lot as it goes through the travel. So the axle path kind of looks like a football. It goes from zero around back to zero. I think it goes backwards 12 millimeters at its peak. And I'd say it's a pretty good neutral design. The pedal kick on this bike is awesome. It has 1.7 degrees of pedal kick, which is unnoticeable. Like you'll have to be splitting hairs if you want to think you can notice 1.7 degrees of pedal kick. So. I was able to achieve that by offsetting the either pulley mount from the center of the main pivot and that uses the iTrack patent. So if I were to want to make these bikes someday, I would pay a patent to iTrack. Their patent features an either pulley that is not connected to the main frame or the rear axle. So on a link that is independent of the main frame and the rear axle. And on a horse link bike, that's that's where this either pulley mount is. So you see on a lot of bikes, they run the either pulley straight through the main pivot, but offsetting it slightly allows you to tweak your anti-squat and pedal kick number. And I found that I got it in a really nice spot. And why we copied the Trek design is that offsetting it slightly is pretty hard to do. The space between the main pivot center and the either pulley center is only about 10 millimeters. So to have a big strong bolt and bearing through there, it was kind of difficult to align them to where they're so close, but not centered on each other. And Trek, they have a single pivot, so they don't have to use the iTrack patent, um, but using the, using the horse link we do. So on both my bikes, I'm running 24 mil of sag. I use a 550 spring on the Fox Shock to achieve that. I think that's kind of a sweet spot um, for racing. It might feel a little nicer to run a higher sag on just a general bike park day, but for me racing, 24, 25% is kind of where I'm shooting for. I think the only time you run less sag than that is if your linkage sucks. So went through all the trouble to make this bike the right progression and leverage ratio and I think you can run a nice sag number with a good design. Now some of the things that worked and didn't work with this bike. I would say this one, even though I tried to not refine it a lot more to have a better bike just because it is better built, it is a lot better than the first bike. The top tube didn't sag under heat treat. We knew that happened in the first one. and. Like I said, Frank beat it back into place and aligned it. He knew to look out for it on this bike. I think it happened on the first one because the head tube, the head tube is a pretty heavy part. If you hold it before the bike gets welded, it's like 120 stack ZS56. So it's a pretty thick tube and a pretty thick wall thickness. So I think that thing just, when it, the whole frame was hot, just made the top tube sag a little bit more than he expected on the first one but he knew to look out for it on this one and aligned it all perfectly when it came out of heat treat and the bike was still hot. Um, we use these cool little uh, cable guides that just screw into the top of the down tube. And for all the hippies out there, they'll be happy to know I'm not throwing away a thousand zip ties every tap session now. I can just unscrew these bolts. Um, but they also work a lot better. They hold the cables better. They're less of a pain. Um, and the cable routing in general on this bike, I was pretty stoked with. I routed the cables down the top of the down tube, and then there's a cable guide here underneath the either pulley, kind of behind the chain ring. And then as well, it runs down the back, down the bottom of the chain stay. 
And on the brake side, it does the same thing and then runs down the bottom of the chainstay and up the inside of the chainstay straight to the brake caliper. So it's really easy to change. You can take the brakes and shifter off without having to take the bike apart, which is super nice. Um, I was able to, when I was doing back-to-back -back testing, swap the frames in about 20 minutes. So, <clears throat> I don't know. I'd say if they told you there was a new cable routing system that was way easier to install, way quicker to swap bikes, didn't rattle, and you could take the brakes on and off without cutting them, that would be a pretty cool idea. Another problem we had with this high pivot frame was that as the bike goes through the travel, the cover that goes over the idler pulley that's attached to the chainstay touches the chain as it as the link rotates forward between the idler pulley and the chain ring. It's not really something that is that much of an issue, but or has presented itself as being a problem, but definitely something we want to avoid in the future if we use this design. And on this bike with the bearing tolerances being better, the linkage is way smoother than the other one. Um, it's as smooth as any other bike I've seen, and uh, I think that really stepped it up and hit the nail on the head with that one. So a bunch of people have asked me why I mounted this shock upside down, and I guess there's two reasons. Um, firstly, Mounting the, re the reservoir is the heavier side of the shock. It's where all the oil is. If you hold a shock off the bike, you can feel that the reservoir side is much heavier. So mounting that to the main frame instead of the linkage, that reservoir isn't moving every time the bike goes through the travel. So keeping it in one spot is a lot less unsprung weight and it's just less weight that the bike needs to move back and forth as it goes from compression to rebound and goes through the travel. So less moving weight's better. It's also lower and more central weight. So anytime you can mount the weight low and center on the bike, that's gonna be better. And we had to do a pretty significant down tube bend to make that work. But only having one size bike, there's enough space. I ride a 475 reach, so there's enough space for the front tire on the down tube. Um, Whereas another bike might have trouble clearing the front tire on a size smaller medium with that down tube bend. Now, is the shock mounted upside down noticeable? Hard to say, but my theory is that if you say no to 10 things that might be unnoticeable, then you might be giving up something that could have added up to a significant gain. And I didn't go through all the trouble to make my own bike to say, you might not notice that, let's not do it. So. Um, I just want to try to leave no stone unturned and if I can fit the shock upside down and there's some engineering theory behind why it would work better, then we're going to do it. Shock bolts. We are still bending shock bolts, but only slightly. Um, I had a bunch of people ask me in the comments or had a bunch of people make some suggestions in the comments of how we can fix that and I totally agree. There's we got it figured out with the new cascade link, how we're gonna fix it, but that's gonna come on the next iteration of the bike. I've taken every, all my feedback from these two frames to design a refined version that is gonna be my third iteration of the bike, and that one will fix the problem. I definitely could do some things to make a new link and fix these bikes, but I'm gonna have the new one before I could get the parts to fix this one. So we're kinda of just band-aiding it through these next couple weeks racing to get these bikes through without too many issues. But the one big thing that I did was I bought a bunch of grade 12.9 steel bolts and they're a lot stronger than the lower grade bolts or titanium bolts I was using. And this one I've used for about three weeks now since we made the last video and it is slightly bent. You can notice it when you pull it out of the link that it kind of wiggles as it comes out. but not nearly as bad as some of the other ones. Um, I went on a bolt supplier website. At first I bought a Trek Session bolt, which was relatively expensive for what it was. And then I bought all these grade 12.9 steel bolts, the same thing on a bolt supplier, and they were 72 cents each. So I had to buy a minimum quantity of $25, or I had to buy a minimum purchase of $25.
So I've got enough bolts to last me a lifetime now with these 12.9 bolts. I had a bunch of people ask me about the cost of these bikes and how much making something like this would cost. And it's kind of hard to track because there's a lot of different expenses and these bikes are one off. So things like design costs, heat treat, um, things that you would amortize over a, a run of bikes, you, you, you spend the same amount of money just to make one. So it ends up being pretty expensive. Um, I'd say each frame ended up being around 10 grand. And a lot of that was to do with, like I said, the design fees, um, engineering fees to do it. And then heat treat to turn the oven on. I think it's 2,500 bucks, whether there's one frame or 25 frames in there. So a lot of those costs you're, you're eating on just making one bike that's not efficient to do. In the future, when I decide on a design that I like, I'm gonna get a, a small batch of frames made for myself to race the season. And I'm sure they'll be a lot cheaper to make six or 10 or whatever it is than just making these one. In fact, it'll probably almost be the same price to make that many than it is just to make one bike. And the costs kind of add up when you're rushing a little bit to get stuff done. Like the season is coming. And even from a couple months ago, I knew weeks are getting closer and that first race being in March is gonna get here quick. So you're kind of putting the pressure on to get these parts so you have time to ride them, isolate any issues, have time to refine it. So invoices come in for stuff and you just pay it as quick as you can so you can get the bikes and sometimes you can kind of get expensive and add up before you know it. But for a custom frame that that is race worthy i'd say these bikes can definitely be improved but they work well 10 grand is probably what you would pay if you were a big bike company too so um stoked it's not so far out of the question that i can do it all myself and not have to have an investor or something like if i'm wasting my money on making my own custom bikes then i'm happy to do that <laughs> And again, if you guys have any questions about these bikes, um, I tried to answer them all in the comments of the last one, had a bunch of cool questions. Like I said, a lot of suggestions on stuff that I certainly appreciate, but we have found a good solution for the refinement of these bikes and we'll be making that on the third version. Um, so yeah, there's problems that in hindsight, yeah, why did I do that? That was stupid to not put a bridge between the link or not have the bearings retained well or the or the uh, the bore on the bearing tolerance being perfect but I'm not an engineer I've never made a bike before so to have these kind of issues is uh, it's part of the process um, and yeah I could just tell you guys that the bike worked really good on the fourth try but I like to show all the broken things and all the issues that I've been having with it too, because um, it's what really happened. But in general, like I said, super stoked on how they're working. I raced with the low pivot bike last weekend at the Costa Rica Open. I was able to get the first win of the year. So bike worked in a race situation and I felt really comfy on it. So this weekend, maybe I'll race the high pivot just so I could have more race time on each bike. I did ride them both in practice last weekend and decided to go with the low pivot. Um, but yeah, this weekend I'll start on this bike and try to spend more time on it than I did last weekend. Thanks for watching and thanks to Kogel for supporting the videos.